came to save us. I'm so glad you came to save us. You came from heaven. You came from heaven to earth to show the way from the earth to the cross. My debt to pay from the cross to the grave, from the grave to the sky. Oh, I lift your name on high. You came from heaven and earth. You came from heaven to earth to show the way. From the earth to the cross, my debt to pay. From the cross to the grave, from the grave to the sky. Lord, I lift your name on high. Sing, Lord, I live. Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, I love to sing your praises. Lord, I love to sing your praises. I'm so glad you're in my life. I'm so glad you came to save us. You came from heaven to earth to show the way from the earth to the cross. My debt to pay from the cross to the grave, from the grave to the sky. Lord, I lift your name on high. You came from heaven to earth to show the way from the earth. salvation and glory honor and power to the Lord our God how many of you guys heard this song might be new to some join us hallelujah hallelujah salvation and glory salvation and glory yes honor and power to the Lord our God. Let's sing that one more time. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Salvation and glory. Salvation and glory. Very good. Honor and power. Honor and power unto the Lord our God. For the Lord our God is mighty. For the Lord our God is mighty. God is omnipotent. For the Lord our God. The Lord our God. He is wonderful. He is wonderful. Let's sing that again. For the Lord our God is mighty. The Lord our God is mighty. Yeah. The Lord our God is omnipotent. The Lord our God is omnipotent. For the Lord our God. The Lord our God. He is wonderful. He is wonderful. Let's sing that all together. The Lord our 
it's going to take a lot of faith to do the work that you guys are doing. But you, as you know, the word of God says that if you have faith, as small as a mustard seed, that you can move mountains. God is going to do some incredible things through you guys. Yes. Above all powers, above all kings, above all natures and all created things, above all wisdom and all the ways of man, you were here before the world began above all kingdoms above all thrones above all wonders the world has ever known above all wealth and treasure of the earth, there's no way to measure what you were. Crucify, crucified, lay behind a stone. You live to die, reject.
let's sing that one more time. Crucify. Crucify. You laid behind the storm. You lived to die. Oh, yes, God. Rejected and alone. Rejected and alone. Like a rose. Trampled on the ground. You took the fall. Lord of me yes, above all above all as we continue in worship the Bible says if you abide in me and I abide in you you'll bear much fruit and this next song just says draw me close to you God and so often as we are doing kingdom work we ask God to bless what it is that we're doing but as we draw closer to God, it is my prayer that we ask God to show us what you're doing. That we can get on your page. Draw us closer into your presence, God. Manifest your glory in our ministries, God. Draw me close to you. Just to hear you say, to hear you say that I'm your friend. You are my desire. You are my desire. No one else will do. Feel the warmth of your embrace. Feel the warmth of your embrace. Help me find. Help me find my way. Bring me back to you. Bring me back to you. Oh God, this is our prayer.
it is our desire to be close to you. Sing just to be close to you. Sing just to be close to you. Just to be close to you. Just to be close to you is my desire. Is my desire. But all else, God, we want to be close to you. Just to be close to you. Breathe on us, Jesus. Just to be close to you. Just to be close to you is my desire. Is my desire. Just be close to you. Just to be close to you. Just to be close to you. It's my desire. It's my desire. Just to be close to you. Just to be close to you. Just to be close to you. turn this light off right here yeah it's too I can't see the people okay can't see the people let's pray first this morning father we thank you so much for your goodness and your grace Lord we thank you for your people that you have brought here together where we can study and learn and together that we could get a sense of urgency of carrying your good news, of your love uh, to the entire world. And Lord, we thank you for it. We thank you that your grace has been upon us so far. The night before last and last night and then yesterday in the workshops and in the pounds. Lord, we thank you for that, that we can learn from each other. And Lord, we pray now that you would bless our time together this morning open our minds, open our hearts, and that your Holy Spirit would do your work in terms of convicting us and challenging us and encouraging us to obey you. So now bless us throughout the rest of this day, that 
people would be very anxious to learn. And now bless our Bible study this morning. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, boy, when we started this movement, uh, as I say, 18 years ago, there was very little uh, had been written on our movement in terms of Christian community development. It was basically let justice roll down and with justice for all of in a quiet revolution, few of the things that we had written. But now people are popping up and we need that. And I want to encourage you, and I really would like to make this a, an annual event like this, that when people have got books that are meaningful, uh, I'd like to bring them up here and let them share those books so you can have reading material. And this morning, I have a dear friend of mine here who have, I worked with him on this book. In fact, I did the introduction of some part of it. And we worked on it long. He's a theologian, a young theologian, have got a group that's called New Wineskin. He has our heart and our concern. And he's a professor of, of theology out, out in Portland. And so we, uh, boy, is doing some work together to further the cause of CCDA and the work we are doing. And Paul, would you just take a minute or so? And I'm going to give you five minutes, okay? Will you take five minutes to tell us a little bit about the book and a little about what you had in mind when you uh, was writing it? Thank you, Dr. Perkins. Uh, I'll start out with just talking about what inspired the writing of this book. In the year 2001, Dr. Perkins spoke at Reed College in Portland, Oregon. And uh, if you don't know anything about Reed College, I need to let you know that the Reedies are brilliant, beautiful people who have a profound regard for social justice. They're also known in the Princeton Review, 2006 edition of Princeton Review, that they're known for getting the highest markings among American universities and colleges for ignoring God or finding uh, the Christian religion and the like irrelevant, for ignoring God on a regular basis. And all Dr. Perkins did the night he spoke at Reed College was share his testimony about how he came to faith in Jesus and about how Jesus had led him to give his life to confronting the structures that oppress people in this land. And after he shared about how Jesus led him to forgive the men, these police officers and the like, who victimized him in that prison cell in Mississippi way back when, and how Jesus led him through that event to give his life not simply for community development for his own people, but to race reconciliation for all people, including those men who had victimized him, the Reed students in unison stood up and gave him a two-minute standing ovation for life so well lived. And I was so moved by that event because the Reed students saw in him someone who had taken his Christian convictions all the way to their logical or illogical conclusion. And they realized that this was not the same kind of Jesus that consumer Christianity and the prosperity gospel movement so often portray. And so I wrote this book that was inspired by that event at Reed College because it shook me. I helped, re I helped organize that event that night with Tony the Beat Poet, who was a student of mine at Multnomah Biblical Seminary at the time, and he was working with other groups. You might know of him through Blue Light like Jazz, but they were working on that event with me, and we organized it, but it also helped reorganize my faith because in Portland, Oregon, where we live, we're really from the state of Missouri, the Show Me State. And as I look at America today, it's increasingly the show me state. Every state is becoming the show me state. And as much as I love Josh McDowell's book, Evidence That Demands a Verdict, That Jesus is Lord, the verdict that Jesus is Lord demands evidence in our lives that he is Lord. And that's what people are looking for today. And that's what they saw in Dr. Perkins that night. And that's what provoked me to write this book. And just a few words about the book, and then I'll talk about the developing partnership. In the book, I talk about consumerism, and consumerism distorts our view of Jesus, and it turns Jesus into the eight pounds, six ounce baby Jesus of Ricky Bobby's table prayer, dinner table prayer, and Talladega Nights. And that Jesus, that eight pounds, six ounce baby Jesus will give us all the stuff that we want, but it won't give us what we truly need. The all-consuming love of the triune God that alone is able to break down the divisions that consume us in this culture and so often destroy the church. And I talk about how the Apostle Paul had to confront the Corinthians for how they themselves, in 1 Corinthians 11, the rich were not sharing with the poor the abundance of the agape feast that God had given them. And so Paul rebukes them. And Jesus invites us to his, his banqueting table, 
the marriage supper of the Lamb, where there is enough for all and for a place for everyone to share in and to sit at that table and to dine with the Lord. And so we need to live in light of that day and pray in light of that day that God would consume us with a compelling vision of Jesus, the all-consuming Jesus, that will lead us beyond and lead me beyond my upwardly mobile and homogeneous tendencies toward the downwardly mobile triune God and his all-consuming vision to bring diversity and unity to Christ's church so that all might see that God has sent his son to save the world. And so at New Wine, New Wineskins at Multnomah Biblical Seminary, we've been, we've been shaped in many ways by the concepts, the values of what Dr. Perkins has shared because I've been studying these things for some time and we're trying to implement with our own what we call biblical theology of engagement with these profound principles and practices that what we see in CCDA, the John Perkins Foundation, and other spheres. And so I'd appreciate your prayers for us as we move forward in this that we can continue to help and even this book, Consuming Jesus, would be of help in terms of continuing to motivate and mobilize the church to be that people whom God desires to make us to be. And would you pray for us in that? And I'd love to talk to you more. I'll be outside. Our booth is out there for New Wine, New Wineskins. I'll be out there later uh, this morning. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> okay. Oh, of course, the idea is that you would buy this book. I guess you know that. <laughs> That's the idea. Okay. If you have your Bibles this morning, would you open them again to the book of Habakkuk? And let's begin uh, this morning and get into it. I'll do just a little review for the people who wasn't here. Uh, this is prior to the Babylonian captivity. And God had made a nation by his own miracle power. And he had given them his law from heaven. The law came down, was delivered from God to Moses. And this was to be a unique nation on earth, was to be God's witness in nation. It was to, when people, the rest of the world, was to know what God was like. They could look at the way this nation lived, and they could know what God was like. They was to do this as a witness to the day when Jesus Christ himself would be incarnated uh, on earth through that nation. The law was given until the seed could come, and the seed then was going to show us God in person. God was going to coronate himself in the person of Christ here on earth. And so the nation had that responsibility to do that, and God was going to allow that nation, and he was going to continue to purify that nation so they could be a good representative of, of, of God's work in the world. Because he gave them that land, he gave them the law, he gave them a measure in how they could know they were doing well by keeping the Sabbath and the sabbatical year, the jubilee, was a chance when things went wrong every 50 years, they would get a chance to start all over again. It was a jubilee. They went into that nation, stayed in that nation, experienced all the prosperity and the blessing of that nation. They became powerful under David and Saul, uh, Solomon. But what happened? There is no record in the Bible that they ever had a jubilee. They disobeyed God. And because they disobeyed God, and God is concerned about them, he made a promise to them. He's going to keep it from them. God's not going to go back to the promise. They're still going to be the nation through which Jesus is going to be born. But you now have to discipline them for their disobedience. And the discipline is that they're going to carry them into Babylon for uh, 70 years. And this is going to be God's way of disciplining them, breaking them from idolatry and greed, and then he's going to bring them back, and they're going to be in the land when Jesus comes. But they disobeyed. Uh, I'm thinking, what I'm thinking here is that our nation, there's never been a nation on earth that made the commitment that this nation made. That that would be, that we held certain truths to be self-evident. That all men was created equal, men and women, humanity was created equal and was endowed by that creator with certain rights. Among these was life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And we build that into that noble promise. But we haven't really tried to make that a reality. We've been passing a, we wouldn't have to have all the civil rights bills and all of those kind of things if we would have acted on the idea that every person is created in the image of God and have inherited dignity. 
And what we have been doing all these years then is, is, is we've reneged on it. And, and I really believe if it happened, I'd like to see it happen. If it happened, it's going to take the church to make that a reality. It's going to take the church to make that a reality. We are reneged. And we ought to be, we ought to be concerned about that. We the church. We haven't been, so what I'm doing here in this here, I'm comparing uh, that nation to our nation here. And, I, and I'm personally in this study, I'm taking on the burden of uh, Habakkuk. And Habakkuk is going to, Habakkuk knows that. And he's a prophet. And now, but he's seeing his nation go down the drain. And I'm seeing my nation go down the drain. The measure of a nation is how it treats his young people and how it deals with prison. Prison is the end. The prison is the end of our failure. And that we have more prisoners than any other nation in the history of the world without war. Right now, and I'm speaking to you today, we have over 3 million people incarcerated in prison and jails in the United States. Almost 50% of those are young black people is a direct result of our neglect and slavery in our society. We ought to be burdened by that. We ought to, if we look at the idea that God holds these truths to be self-evident, and we see here that we are not working for the liberation and the freedom of all people. This should burden our heart. And this is what it burdened this Habakkuk's heart. He could see that the nation had all of this, all the wealth, and all the prosperity. But he see the crime and the violence in his society. And now he's crying out to God. He's called as a prophet. And I need to go over that again. When you're called to be God's spokesman, God puts the burden of the world upon you. Or maybe yet he puts the burden of a calling that he has for you. He gives you a burden for that. And then you are to bear that burden. And then you are to, he's to help you with that burden. He said, come unto me all of you that are labeling and heavy laden and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Learn of me. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. See, the burden and the yoke is the same thing in society. And God is under this yoke with us to carry this burden of the people in society. What a leader is all about is carrying the burden of society. We wouldn't have so many people eager for leadership that we have now if they understood leadership. Leadership is to bear the pain and the broken of the people in society and to organize people around you and to help you to carry that burden. I mean, that's why, I, that's my relationship to Wayne Gordon and his relationship to me. Uh, he carries some of my burdens. I can lay my burdens on him and he can lay his burden on I me. Mean, and I can lay my burden on our board of directors and on my friend. And I care him. And I, uh, the reason I can persevere that I take my pain to my friend and I tell my friend, I got a pain here. I need help with this pain. And my friends come to my rescue. They bear the burden with me. In life. That's what leadership is about. Leadership is about loving the people that you, that you are leading and concern for the biggest society. But then helping them to bear, Pat, you bear my burden. You bear my burden. You bear my burden. Every year you come down and help us with our housing. And Zachariah, you bear, I go to you. I don't hesitate. I get on the phone. And I expect you to bear the burden with me. And we bear each other's burden. It was right for Vera May. I couldn't make it there to be at your father's funeral. It was right for us to be there standing beside of you. And see, can we bear a little of your mother and your burden? That's what leadership is all about. It's about bearing the burden of society. Jesus took upon him all of our sin on that cross. Your sin, my sin, Ben Laden's sin, Adolf Hitler's sin, all of the sins of the world were laid upon him. And so we have to take, as our speaker said last night, we have to take our cross. We have to pick up our cross. And we have to take some of that pain. And the Apostle Paul understood that so beautiful. He said that I may share in his suffering. That I may share in his suffering in society. That's what it means to be a leader. 
all of this glamour stuff and all of this stuff that you got the leader got to have all of this in society is not God's way of leadership. God's way of leadership is to be exemplary leadership. Identify with the pain. So he had taken this, this burden. So this is the burden that he did see. What happens here in our lesson here, he shows him all of the pain. Uh, now he shows him the pain of, of his own society. He sees it. In the, in the first chapter here, in the first verses here, he, he's, he's talking to God. To tell you the truth, uh, uh, Habakkuk is really mad with God. Now, he's a devout person. He, he loved, there's not a person in the scripture that, that I feel that was more committed to God than this guy, Habakkuk. He loved God. You're going to see that in the last chapter. And he loved his people so, so wonderfully. But at this point, he's mad with God. He's mad with God because God has put this burden upon him. And now he sees this burden and he's crying out to God to do something about it. And it don't seem like God is doing anything about it. And he is mad with God. What's going to happen in this chapter? We're going to go through it. What we're going to see in this chapter here is we're going to hear him laying his pain out. You're going to hear God answering him. And then you're going to, you're going to see then he's going to come to the conclusion that God is God. And that he's going to let God have his way. And that he's going to live out his life by faith. And he's going to tell all of us, the just shall go on living by faith. You got the book right there. He's, he's, he's mad. He's mad. Here, here. Mad. I, I have been mad with God. I've been mad with God. And you would think I was mad with God the night I was in that Brandon jail when I was almost being beaten to death. I didn't get mad with God. I was just fearful that night. I thought this was the way that God had ordained for me to die. I was fearful that night as I was tortured in that, in that jail. But it was that the night I saw the, the wretchedness of racism. It was that night I felt the pain of bigots. Uh, those men looked like to me that they were demons. That in it. it's, it's easy for me to understand Abergrave. It is easy for me to understand how that, that people can take their anger out on individuals in society. I experienced that. But I didn't get angry with God tonight. But I was angry with God. Let me tell you when I was angry with God. I was angry with God when he took Spencer, my son. And I said it. I said it at his uh, funeral and at his uh, Wait, I said it. I got up and I said, uh, God, I'm mad with you. You took my son. You took my son, and I'm mad with you. I had ideas about my son, and you've taken him. But God sobered me. He sobered me. It's all right to be mad with God. God can take it. Jonah was mad with God. God can take it. God, God can take your anger. You know, he can manage it. He can handle it. And so I said to him, I'm, I'm mad with you, God. But then something came to my mind. And what came to my mind was Jim Ellick's poem. He was a guy who died carrying the gospel to the Indian down there. He wrote a little poem. And he said, uh, one is no fool to give up that which you cannot keep. I can keep him. Life belongs to God. One is no fool to give up that which you cannot keep to gain that which you cannot lose. Then I said to God, I said, God, what I'm so mad with you about. I'm so mad with you because I would have liked to have given him to you. I don't think I would have. But, but you know, you do that when you're in this conversation with God. Uh, 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 I said, God, I would have liked to have given him to you and I would like to have given him to you as a reconciler. Because to a certain degree, we had used Spencer that way. When we got ready to integrate the high school in Jackson, in, uh, in Mendenhall, we sent him out there. And he was the first black in the high school. And he endured hell for us. He told us about that afterward. 
but he did it. And at the same time, he was an A student. He was an A student. Came from across the track in the ghetto. And he was an A student. Then when it came time to uh, play basketball, he and Larry led the school, that little school of 3,000 people in the rural Mississippi. They led them to the state championship. And Spencer was the most valuable player. Everything we had asked Spencer to do, he did. I think he, he died of a broken heart. I think he wanted to be a reconciler. And I think he failed. I think he thought he failed to be a reconciler. I, I think he thought it was too hard. That community was about to blow up. You can read that in Chris's book there. And I really believe that my son died of a broken heart in society. I don't think he understood. I think he thought because he integrated the school. I think he thought because he led the team to a championship. I think he thought because he wrote the, one of the most creative books, he and Chris, more than he could. I think he thought that he could be a reconciler. But I want you to know that racism is too deep. I really believe that our organization here probably looks like to me it's the most reconciled gathering in America. But I really believe that we're just scratching the surface. I think we're just going along scratching the surface. Scratching the surface. I think it would just take one little incident and this thing would blow out. Blow out of some sun. We have got to get deeper. We've got to get deeper. we got to believe that we are equal before God. And that we are equal sinners before God. And we all need God's forgiven grace. All of us need that in our society. I don't think we know the depths of our own damage. I don't think that we understand the depths of what it meant to live in a nation where you're inferior. And act out of that inferiority. And the damage that would do to you of a people. I think our crime and our violence and our consumerism in our community has to do with our historical oppression. And I don't think that white folks have no idea what their superiority and imperialism and their behavior have to do with the oppression of people in society. If we could come together and come to grips with those, we could be God's reconciling force. That's what I want CCDA to be. I want CCDA to be a group of people where we don't went beneath the surface, that we are really concerned for the soul and the body and the spirit. We're concerned about the whole person. And so that's what I want CCDA to be. I want us to be a place where we love each other dearly and that we're willing to work. We want to make a different picture. We want to show that the gospel is the power of God to reconcile Jews and Gentiles, blacks and whites together, Native Americans all together in one body. And that we can really do something meaningful. I think if we could do that, we would be a powerful force in America. That's a challenge to me. It ought to be a challenge to you. Well, why don't we help our, not only our nation, but have our church to live up to its promise that we might be one, that Jesus who died for the church prayed that we might be one, that the world would know that we are Christian because of the love we have one for them. I want to be a part of that body. I want to be a part of that. I would like for CCDA to represent that. And I would like for you to go back to your own churches in your own city and pray for that, hope for that, that you can bring them together. Pastor Cunningham, I was moved that's a few months ago. When I went down to the Gulf Coast, and we were celebrating the work we was doing down there, they was doing down there, and that went down there. And then it's all predominantly all white church. There was white and blacks together in that church, breaking down some of those barriers. Now, I know it's surface right now. I know it's surface, but boy, we got to, it encourages us to see that in Mississippi, in Mississippi, because we've been so damaged down there. We've been so damaged. And I want him, people like him to continue to do that. Let's go back to our neighborhood. Let's go back. We don't have to worry about, about, about you. And I thought you was Andy. And the, I said, but Andy, who read the rescue mission in, uh, in Los Angeles, he run the, rest, the biggest rescue mission in the country. But you don't have to worry about him being reconciled there. I mean, the poor and the outcast will get together. <laughs> Look, it's, it's, it's us who are sophisticated can't get together. I mean, he can put them together. At the bottom, we are together. 
But as soon as we get sophisticated, I mean, we want to show our different. And we want to set up those barriers. We want to set up those race class barriers so you can know that I'm better than you in society. Well, let me go on here and try to finish here. Okay. I don't preach my sermon now. This is, this is, this is the beauty of this. I pray. Okay, look what he said now. Let's go here. He said, oh, Lord, how long will you cry and not hear me? He said, if I'm ever crying about the violence in the community, it don't seem that you care anything about it. He said, spoil and violence is before me, and I'm a grieved person, and you're not doing anything about it. He says, look what he says here. He said, therefore, the law is slack. The people who got the money will get the best law. You, you can't convict uh, those uh, people who, uh, who uh, got a lot of money and a lot of fame. It's just sort of different for O.J. Simpson was the first example of a black man having enough money to beat the rap. You, you, you understand? And I mean, that, that's what hurt so bad. That's what hurt people so bad. The only thing he did is what white folks been doing all the time. You, you, you know what I'm saying? And they never saw a black person do that, you know, who murdered somebody and sort of got away. <laughs> that, that's what, uh, that's what uh, garden is for. <laughs> that's his job. God is concerned about the whole organization. <laughs> he wasn't so concerned about me. It's the organization <laughs> that, I, that, I re that I represent him. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay, let's, let's go back. Look what he says here. He says, therefore, the law is slack. And judgment and justice never goes forward. For the wicked surround the righteous and no justice come for us. Now we know we got that in society. We got that, that's why we don't have health care. The drug companies done surround our representatives. We done almost made our people all believe that this nation couldn't provide health care for all of us. It's the richest nation, and they don't re recognize that. We don't, they done made us believe that it wouldn't be a benefit that have made all our people well. The best we could. We, we, we done made us believe that. And so we mess around with this health care, and, and they pass some kind of little help bill for, for all the children in America, and the president veto it. We can't afford it. We can't afford it. And so we're in a mess. He sees that. So he, he cries out to God. Now, let's listen to God answer. This is beautiful. This is beautiful. See, God ain't afraid of him. God don't care about his anger. <laughs> you know, but, and God going to still deal with him kindly. God going to deal with just like he dealt with Jonah. I mean, Jonah was mad that, that God saved those Ninevites. I mean, he was angry. He said, God said, he, he said, God, I'm angry. And, and, and I'm angry unto death. God said, um, that's all right. You ought to be angry. <laughs> yeah, that's all right. You ought to be angry. And watch God now as he deal with, with this wonderful prophet here, this angry prophet. He says to him now, God is speaking now. God said, look now, look now, behold, I'm thinking to do something. I'm thinking to do something so, I don't know what word for it, so marvelous, marvelous. I'm thinking to do something. And, and this word here is, 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 uh, is, is, is not good, but it's dynamic. It's not good, but it's dynamic. But from God's perspective, it's good because he's going to erase some of the sin and he's going to punish the people for the sin. I'm going to do something that's very marvelous. What are you going to do, God? I'm going to raise up these Babylonians. And these Babylonians is going to be my rod of discipline to you. Uh, look, let, me, let's, let me show you how they... And I'm going to raise up these violent people. I mean, these violent people. These people who know how to do warfare. And these are cruel people. I'm going to raise them up. And they're going to be your discipline. You know, I, I, I sometimes I wonder. I, I, I think about it. I, I wonder, is God raising up the Al-Qaeda to discipline the world? 
I want to see raising up the Al-Qaeda to discipline the church. And I think about it. I, I, if we have a, a church that has been on prosperity and using women as our props to sell our merchandise, our undressed women, and Ben Laden is using all his wisdom and knowledge to keep women, women dressed up and covered. Y'all know that's what the war is about. Y'all know that's what the war is about. The war is about sex. This is a sex war. This is a war about whether we want women uncovered or covered. That's, the, that's what the Taliban is. And as they look at our TV, they see that we use women as means of advertising our product all over the world, on the internet, everywhere. And all this pornography and stuff is destroying us. It's killing us in society. I, I just, sometimes I don't know whether or not we are any morally better than the Al-Qaeda. They are wicked. But I'm saying that we are wicked too. That's what I'm saying. I, I'm saying that we are all like sheep have gone astray. We have turned all of us to our own way. And could it be that God is saying enough is enough in our society? I don't know. I don't know. And I really want to be careful with that. Because I don't want, I don't want to say that our boys who have died over there died in vain. They attacked us. I understand all of that. I'm thinking about the morality of our people. I'm talking about the morality of our people. These people are devoted to God. Uh, they are suicide bombers. And, and God don't ask us to be suicide bombers. He says, uh, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercy of God, that you present your bodies as living sacrifice, holy and acceptable of God, which is your reasonable service. But be not conformed to this world, but be you transformed by the renewing of your mind so you might show what is that good and acceptable will of God. That's what we are left here to do is be light in this dark world. And we don't want to do that. We don't want to. I'm raising questions. Let me move on here. And so let's look at what he says is going to happen. I'm just going to read it here. This is God's answer here to his prayer. He said, Behold, look among the heathen and see what they are doing. And I'm thinking the work, a work that is marvelous in your day. Even if you would see it, you would not believe it. For lo, I'm raising up these Chaldees, that bitter and nasty, hasty nation, which shall march through the breadth of this land to possess the dwelling place that are not there. He describes what they look like. They are terrible. And they are dreadful. They don't understand justice at all. And they don't care much about dignity. Uh, they have become a, a law unto themselves. Their horsemen also are swifter than lepers. They are more fierce than evening wolves. I was in Kenya in a park. If you ever seen any evening wolves just before sunset, that is one of the most terrible things you've ever seen. When they go through, it looks like that they would just consume everything that's in their way. They are vicious, vicious. And he's describing this military might of, uh, of, of Babylon. is like evening wolves here. Uh, 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 where am I at now here? Oh, he also says, and they are, they, they are like, they're like buzzards. Like buzzards, he called them eagles, uh, scooping down to eat people up. He's describing this er its army. He's trying to show a picture here. They shall come all for violence. Their face shall be sh shall be fierce, and they'll be like the like the eastern wind, just sort of blowing everything as it go. They shall gather the captivity. Daniel, Meshach. Benigo was a part of that captivity. He, they're going to gather them up. And they are not going to have any, uh, take them captive as sand. They shall scoff at the king. They'll laugh at the kings there. And anybody's in authority. And the princes. 
and they shall scoff at them, and they shall derive them, make fun of them, make sport out of them. And then when they come to those fortified cities, they will just take the, uh, the earth and build, push the earth up into those fortified cities, and so they can march through those cities. They are powerful. They are powerful. He's telling them about the judgment here that's going to take place. And then he says, look what he says in verse 11. Then shall his mind change, and he shall pass over, and, 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 uh, and then he will, he will, they will sacrifice to their gods. That's the description of this judgment. So God answered him back, tell him what he's going to do. He described the people going to do it. Uh, this makes uh, Habakkuk even matter. <laughs> it makes it matter uh, with God. But look what he's going to say here now. Look, look, let's, let's move here, down here. He's, he said, then he, he, Habakkuk says this here. He said, I will stand. Now he and God have had that conversation. You get the idea? God done had his, he done had his conversation with God, and now God has spoke back to him. And then he said, I'm going to uh, get up on the watchtower, and I'm going to watch to see what God is going to do. See what God is going to do. Let's, let's go to that one now. I will stand up on my watch, and I will set me up on the tower, and I will watch to see what he shall say unto me, and what I shall answer when I am rebuked. This guy, this is another thing, folks. This is another thing. I want to say this, Kat, I want to say this. Uh, our Christianity, some of it is becoming too cheap. It is too cheap talk. It, it is not talk. We talk this religious talk without any thoughts. And, 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 and that, that gives to people out there, you know, like walking around, and God has just been telling them everything this morning. I hear all that kind of stuff all the time. And when people come to me and they come to me to be consulted about something, and they'll come to me and they'll tell me everything that God has just told them, and I said, then what do you want me to do? <laughs> God done told you everything, and I'm not smarter than God. So what do you want me to do? I want me to do that. And then I meet them three months from there, and they got something else God had me to, to tell them to do. Not wasn't related to what God told me first. God don't act like that. God calls us for life. We discover the gifts that he give us. And we're to use those gifts and talent the rest of our life. God ain't off and on. In our society. And I hear that kind of stuff. And, it, and it is, I mean, people that get on a plane, come down to Mississippi to see me, to tell me what God done told them. <laughs> and six months later, they're doing something else. Six months later, they're telling something else. I said, why you wasn't doing, keep doing what you said that God told you to do? Well, that church I was in didn't meet my need. <laughs> like, that's why the church exists. The church exists to carry this good news of the gospel and to be concerned about the broken in society. Jesus did not come to meet his own needs, but he came to meet the needs of those who are out there in pain, and he demonstrated that by the way he lived. And then finally, he gave his life for the sins of the world. I, Christianity, is too cheap. We got cheap grace, folks. And we're talking like that. That's why the world don't believe us. That's why they're not following us. They'll follow us if we'll just tell them they can have everything they want. If I get up here and tell y'all that God is going to give y'all everything y'all want, y'all would like me a lot. <laughs> but one thing that God promised us, that if we're going to have faith in him, that we had to suffer. And so arm yourself with suffering. And the greatest suffering is rejection. The greatest suffering is rejection. And so, let me listen at what God is going to say here as he, uh, as he uh, talks to him again. Now Habakkuk, Habakkuk is perplexed in his behavior. Look, he don't understand. He don't understand. He done told God about our problem here. And God said, I'm going to correct your problem by using the Chaldees to punish you, you know. And now he's still perfect. And so he, the prophet then, 
uh, goes back to God here. Listen what he said. Are thou not, he's talking to God. And this, I wish I could put it in a tune. It's like he really talks back to God. He said, God, aren't you from everlasting to everlasting? Isn't you God? Yeah, of course, of course, he know that. Are you God? And, uh, uh, my God? Aren't you the Holy One? Then he says to God like he's talking back. Even in God's punishment, he said, we shall not all die. Oh, Lord. But you have ordained them for judgment. And almighty God, thou has established them for our correction. He's getting the message. He's getting the message. He's agreeing with God. He's agreeing with what God is saying. He, he still don't want it to happen. And what we're going to come to here is that he's going to find that God now is working with him like he worked with Jonah. He's talking to him. He's trying to get him to see his loving kindness in all of this by the way he's dealing with him. He said, um, look what he says in verse, uh, uh, mm, what verse am I at now? I'm at verse, uh, mm. and the Lord answered him and said, and the Lord answered him and said, now God, he's now, is in, I'm in verse, I'm in chapter two. He is now, uh, God is answering him. And he said in verse two, the Lord answered me and said, write the vision and make it plain upon tablets that he may run that readeth it. Or better yet, make it plain enough that as we run and as people run, they can read and understand this vision. And that's, that's, I, I think about God took it that we would teach uh, our people how to read and write. Y'all thought of that? Uh, God uh, takes that for granted as he relates to us. When he gave us the law, he said, uh, put it on the doorstep, put it on the door, put it over the shadows so you can know the will of God, so you can do the will of God, so you can understand the will of God. Write the vision and make it plain. And what vision do we have? We are living with the words of the prophets and the apostles. And our lives should be based on our reading. How do you read it, Jesus says to the scribes and the Pharisees. How do you read it? How do you read the law? You read the law which you should love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and all your mind. Uh, how do you read the New Testament? What do you read the New Testament? You read the New Testament the same way. Uh, this is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us. And that we need to love one another. And by this may all mankind know that you're my disciples. It's because of the love you have one for another. Uh, write the vision. Write the vision. The problem is that we have carved out our own American version of religion. And it has very little to do with the Bible. With the Bible. They did that in Mississippi. They did that in South Africa. They've done that. And I'm sure they've done that around. We got a religion based upon our own selfish desires instead of a religion based upon God. Most of the stuff I hear today, people telling me about God, is folklore. It is what somebody else have said about God. You know, and that's a big deal today. Say what I say. And what I say might not have been researched enough. I think we ought to say what God says. And we ought to be telling people what God is all about in our society. We need to write the vision and we need to make it plain. And then we need to bring a sense of urgency back to the church. We, uh, we don't have a sense of urgency. That Christians should live with the idea that Jesus might, we should plan like he's, it's going to be a thousand years before he comes. We should behave like he's coming tomorrow. Like he's coming tonight. He that has this hope in him purifies himself, even as he is pure. We need to bring a sense of urgency back to the church. 
We need to bring a sense of urgency to our community. We, I'm, I'm fearful for what's going to happen to the next generation. I, I'm fearful that when 72% of all of our children in my community is being born out of wedlock. I, I, I'm fearful uh, that all of my black boys are in jail. I'm fearful how we're going to put families together again. I'm fearful that I, we work with our boys, work with our girls in our school, and they become A students like that. I'm fearful of where they're going to find a husband. Those kind of things fearful for me. To me, it's urgent. I got some little granddaughters. I would like for them to be mothers. And I'd like for them to have husbands. But boy, that's a difficult task before us today. And we don't seem to have no urgency to that in our community. Let me close then for today. He said, write the vision, make it plain. Verse, uh, he, now he says something. For, for the vision is not for now, but it's for a point of time, and it's surely going to come to pass. And then he says, Be, behold, the soul which is lifted up is not upright in his heart, but the just shall live by faith. This is one of the most profound passages of Scripture in the Bible. This scripture is about how we should live. What he's getting, uh, uh, what he's getting uh, Habakkuk to see. Even though he don't understand all that's going on, and it may be not much it looked like he can do about it, but he tells him, what I want you to do is to live by faith. That's the verse of scripture that transformed Martin Luther, the great reformer. This verse here. When he was believing that he had to do penance, do all of that to please God. And as he was climbing steps and doing penance, this verse busted through his mind that the just shall live by faith. He took that out and he revolutionized the world. And the Protestant church was born, you know, if we would take what we know and if we would go out living by faith and if we would believe God, we can deal with some of the issues and pain of our day. We're going to come back tomorrow and have some more discussion uh, on this. My burden, my concern is that we as churches, one of the things I like to say, we need to support the churches that you come from that has a sense of mission and a concern for people and we should go back and try to transform some of them. But what we got to do really is that we really have got to start church planting. Church planting in these very well-defined poverty broken communities and use those new church plants as a means of discipleship and, and a means of raising up leadership. Because the idea now, you got that, but God bless the big churches. But as the big churches get bigger, leadership development goes down. And as churches are being started when they're young, leadership development spreads. And you end up with more leaders in the society. And, and so we need to go into these places that are difficult, into department complex public housing and then rent an apartment there and turn that into a house church and then get you some elders, raise up you some elders, some deacon, some deaconess and people and have those young folks speaking and sharing. They don't have a chance to express themselves outside of violence, outside of drive-bys. Another thing, we need to go in there just like it was in those schoolhouses. None of y'all are not old as I, I was. I went to a one-room schoolhouse. And what we had to do everything, we had to put on the plays, and we would put on the play. And boy, I mean, I first play I saw in a boy, I must have been about six or seven years old. Boy, it convinced me that I wanted to be an actor. You, you, you know what I'm saying? It convinced me it had to be an act. I'm saying, we, but we don't have that kind of inspiration. And they ain't going to do it now in the integrated schools. 
No, they can't get good. They can't get together enough to do that. And so we've got to organize these churches so that the young folks can display their talent, display their position. And we're doing it all the time. And if you do that, the people in my community, I know how to get a crowd. I can get me a crowd. I can fill up my little place. I know how to fill it up. All I have to do is get the children to put on a program and dress them up and tell their mother and father that everybody got to be dressed up. And they come to that. And, and, and they come out tonight that these children are going to put on something. They're going to come out there with all of these cameras flashing everything. They're going to fill that place up. Because people still got hope for their children. And so we have to go into these communities and do that. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for this time that we could spend together. And now I pray that you would bless the remaining of our time. I pray that you would be near and close uh, to Gordy as he prepares to share his heart and his burden with us. We ask all this in Jesus' precious name and for his sake. Amen. Y'all keep on buying the books. Keep on buying them. I sign them. <laughs>